Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to our Wednesday night class. This week we are studying Parashat Vayeshev. It's so nice to see everyone. Tonight's class is sponsored by Mitch Chusid in memory of his wife who passed away almost a year ago. Robin Chusid, may her great memory be blessed. And hopefully the study of Rabbi Le Payman and Rav Shimshin Pincus may serve her as an eternal memory. Amen v'amen. Very interesting to our portion this week. We are finally getting to the point where Jacob is returning home after 36 years to his parents, to the land of Israel. And the Torah says Jacob is there and he wants to settle in. He finally comes and he sits and he dwells, he sets up camp back home with his, with his parents. Now, Rebleib takes a very important spin or, uh, you know, insight on the relationship of our patriarchs and their uniqueness compared to any other biblical characters or any other human being, for that matter, in Jewish history. And the Talmud he quotes to us in Masechet Brachot tells us that there are only three that were called the patriarchs, obviously Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And there were only four that were called the matriarchs, Sarah, Rivka, Rachel, and Leah. And the Talmud then asks, well, why not more? Why only three patriarchs and four matriarchs? Right? If you want to say the reason why we refer them as to as, as our patriarchs is because we all know that we came from Isaac, from, from J uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob because that's already before the division of the of the tribes, if, if we would refer to Reuven, so to say, as a patriarch, so then we'll, he's not everyone's patriarch unless you came from the tribe of Reuben or the tribe of Levi. So therefore, it makes sense if you want to say that we'll stop at Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob because we all date back to Jacob or we all source ourselves back to Jacob. But then we have a problem with the matriarchs, the Talmud says, not everyone is from the descendants of Rachel, some could be part of Leah, some could be part of Rachel. So why is it that we go only Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, then how come would we be including Rivka, uh, Rachel and Leah as our matrix as well? So to that answer, the Talmud says, up until Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they were considered very special including our matriarchs, the four of them, those were considered very special. From then on, they weren't at the same level any longer as those original three patriarchs and four matriarchs. So Rebley wants to understand what makes a person special or important that they give them the, that would give them the title of patriarch or matriarch. What makes them I guess his question is greater than any of the other tribes. Why is a uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob different than any of the tribes? So Reb Leib says that God spoke directly to each of our patriarchs. We don't find that Hashem spoke to our Shvatim, to any of the tribes, none of Jacob's children. Even Joseph's dreams, they were divine inspiration, but they weren't clear, crystal clear, like the way God communicated to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So based on that, Rebleib says, one second, how come were the matriarchs considered so great? Hashem never spoke to them. Maybe to, well, not maybe, for sure to Sarah Imenu, but to Rivka, Rachel, and Leah, Hashem never spoke to. And says Reb Leib, they are considered 100% partners with their husband. And therefore, they are at the same level of uniqueness and specialty. So they were considered the matriarchs as well. So it was those three generations, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and corresponding to Sarah, Rivka, Rachel, and Leah. Reb Leib says because of their greatness... Hashem, we, we pray, sorry, our, our sages instituted that whenever we pray to Hashem, we always pray, pray to Him as we start in our Amidah, 
Eloke Avraham, the God of Abraham, Eloke Yitzchak, the God of Isaac, Veloke Yaakov, and the God of Jacob. We don't say Veloke Reuven or Eloke Shimon or Levi. Although God is the God of all of, of our ancestors, but because of our patriarchs' great, great accomplishments and stature and, and importance, we when we pray and we praise Hashem and we 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 um, request, we plead to him, we, we do so in the name of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Reblade says the main chidush, the main novelty from this piece of Talmud, that there are only three patriarchs, is trying to make a point that Joseph, in his greatness, as amazing as he was, is not considered a patriarch. And he's going to go on to prove it, even though the last four Torah portions in the book of Genesis speak about Joseph, which, by the way, is more than the Torah, more time than the Torah spends on Abraham and Isaac. With the exception of, of Jacob, Joseph gets way more uh, time, screen time, you'd like to call it, or uh, or page time than Abraham and, and, and Isaac, along with all of his amazing unique virtues and character traits and tons and tons of teachings from our oral Torah, the Midrash, the Talmud, the Zohar, that tell us so many great things about Joseph. Nevertheless, he's still not considered a patriarch. So Leib puts that on pause for a moment. And he says, we see and we read so much greatness about Joseph and how he stood out in comparison to his brothers. But we don't find later in Jewish history, he asks, that the descendants of Joseph stood out for their greatness. Joseph himself stood out, shined amongst the rest, but Joseph's descendants seemingly didn't. Why don't we find that the greatest Torah scholars and the greatest leaders of the generation were from the tribe of Yosef, right? We see them from the tribe of Levi, from the tribe of Yehuda, but why not from the tribe of Joseph? We find one example, a good example of a great leader from the tribe of, of Joseph, and that was Joshua. Joshua was from the tribe of Joseph, and he takes over Moshe Rabbeinu's position and he leads the Jewish people into the land of Israel. Rebbe says this is an anomaly. We don't find any other place that Joseph's children or descendants led the Jewish people anytime after Joseph, uh, anytime after um, Joshua. And the question is why, he asks. So, in order to answer this question, we have to understand the essence of Joseph. What was his purpose? Reblaib says Yosef's purpose was to complete Jacob's own essence. He was the completion to his father. He proves this from, well, until, until Joseph was born, Yaakov was lacking. He felt like he wasn't complete and he was missing something. He proves it from only after Joseph was born. Even after Jacob had 10 children and Tons of great wealth as he, that he's amassed for himself. Only when Joseph was born did he want to return home to his parents. And only after Joseph was born was his name changed from Yaakov to Israel. So Joseph was the completion of Jacob. And Yosef's own sons were put at the same status as Jacob's own sons. When Jacob says, take a look at your screen. This is at the end of Jacob's life. He sees, his, he sees Joseph's children. He says, and now your two sons were born to you in the land of Egypt until I came to you. 
They are mine. Ephraim and Menashe, Kiruvan and Shimon, Yuli, Ephraim and Menashe shall be exactly to me like Reuven and Shimon. Jacob himself is saying that Joseph's own children are being elevated to the status of Jacob's own children. So this fits perfect with the concept that there are only three patriarchs to exclude Joseph. Because we would have thought, oh, maybe Joseph was the fourth patriarch because, look, his own children were tribes. Comes the Talmud and says, even though Joseph was absolutely amazing and outstanding and important, but not at the level of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, there are only three patriarchs. And now we can understand why we don't find any of Joseph's descendants who stand out later on in history. It is, Reb Lebi says, because Joseph's tribe dissolved and split into two parts. There was the tribe of Menashe and the tribe of Ephraim. There was no tribe called Joseph. Why? Hashem orchestrated it this way, that Joseph would not have his own tribe, would not be called Shevet Yosef. It's Shevet Menashe and Shevet Ephraim. Why? Because Joseph was just a continuation of Jacob. His whole essence, his identity was just a complete Jacob. And Rav Lay proves this from Joseph's own name. He proves that Joseph's entire essence is just as a, as a, as a filler, as a makeup, as a completion for Jacob himself. Look how he proves it. He says, when, when Leah finally has her first child, the Torah says, she names the child Reuben. Genesis chapter 29, verse 32, ben. And Leah conceived and she bore a child. And she named him Reuben. And then she explains why. Kiamira, for she said, Kira'a Hashem be'oni ki ata shi, because the Lord has seen my affliction, for now my husband will love me. Of course, we know Reuven was the very first of the of, of the tribes to be born, the first child that Jacob had. And she said, You know, she's saying, you know why I named him Reuven? Because Hashem saw, re'u from the word ra'a, Hashem saw my pain and that I was disliked and even hated compared to my sister Rachel by my husband. Hashem blessed me first. The Gemara, however, gives another reason why Reuven's name was Reuven. The Gemara says that Leah said, look at the difference between my firstborn and my father-in-law's firstborn. Reuma ben beni leven chami. Come look at the difference between my first and my father-in-law's first. My father-in-law's first was Esav. He was a good for nothing. And my firstborn Reuven is going to be a tzaddik. That's what the Gemara says. The ga on mi Vilna, the Gra, famously known, he asks an amazing question. He says, but Leah already gave a reason why she named him Reuven. Why does the Talmud have to give a subsequent reason? What's the Talmud adding? Leah said the reason is because Hashem saw my pain. The Talmud says no, because she's trying to say, look at the difference between my son and my father-in-law's son. Why does the Talmud need to tell us another reason? We already have a good reason. Comes the Gaon Mivil Nani gives a fascinating answer. He says, if you look at all of Jacob's children when they're born, all of Jacob's children when they're born, first, the reason for their name choice is given, and then the name is said. However, when it comes to Reuven, first the name is given, and then the reason is given. 
says the Gra. Since it was given in that answer, since the Torah records it in that answer, first as the name and then the reason, it seems like that there's something else, another reason why he was named Reuven. And that's why they came and gave it another explanation for him. Not for any other of the children, only for Reuven. Again, all the tribes, first an explanation for the name was given, then the name was given. For Reuven, first his name was given, then an explanation was given. The Gra says the reason for that is to tell us that there's another name that is hidden from us, and the Torah is not even telling us another reason why his name was Reuven. Now Reb Leib takes this Gra and he says, you know what? We can apply the same concept by Joseph. Joseph is the only other one of the children of Jacob that his name was given first and then a reason after. Rachel first called him, jo called him Joseph and then explained why. Take a look at your screen. Genesis chapter 30, verse 24. Vatikrat shemo Yosef lemor. And she says his name is Joseph. Yosef Hashem li ben acher. She said she named him Yosef so that the Lord may grant her another son. First the name, then the reason. Says Reb Leib. We have to say the same thing as the Gras says by Reuven. That since his name was given and then a reason, there's got to be another reason why he was named Joseph. More than just a prayer in Hashem, add me, Yosef, Lehosif, add another name. There was another reason. What's that reason? He says we have to look deep into the what the word, the term Yosef means. If we scroll to the beginning of the book of Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 22, it says, So now, why should we die for this great fire will consume us? If we continue to hear God's voice, or the, the, hear the voice of the Lord our God anymore, we will die. Basically, the Jewish people are complaining to Moshe Rabbeinu. Everything that we're doing and just traveling and wandering the desert, we're going to die if we continue listening to you and listening to God. Which means if we continue to hear the, ver the voice of God, we continue to listen to him. So the word Yosef means to continue, means to mamshich in Hebrew. Comes, Reb Leibin explains, Rachel obviously had prophecy. And you know why she called him Joseph? She called him Joseph because he is a continuer. He's a continuation. He's the mamshich of Yaakov. Yosef completed Jacob's greatness the same way that Yosef completed Jacob's greatness. Yosef's descendant, Yoshua, completed Moshe Rabbeinu's greatness. And he took on the role of filling in the shoes of Moshe Rabbeinu when he went, when he passed on. It's, it's very deep, but it makes so much sense. So the conclusion of Reb Leib's beautiful piece on this week's Torah portion is number one, there's only three patriarchs and Joseph is not included. And he gave reasons why we should think that he's included. Nevertheless, he was great and amazing, but not at the same level as our patriarchs. Even though his own two children became tribes, just like Jacob's children were tribes. But you know what's so great about Joseph? What's so great about Joseph is that he completed Jacob's essence. And because of that, his identity had to be dissolved. That he would not have tribes in his own name, it would be in his children's name. And he was blessed for it. Jo Joseph was the firstborn. That's why he had a double portion. He had two tribes, double portion of the land of Israel compared to the rest of the tribes. So Joseph was amazing. And we're going to soon see now in the next part of tonight's class how amazing he was in, in a certain way as well. But not at the level of a patriarch. It's next time we pray our Amidah and we pause and we say, Eloke Abraham, Eloke Yitzchak, Eloke Yaakov, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. We should think that it's specific to them because their greatness, their level, was unique to them. And as Rav, Rav Leib says, 
anything that happened specifically to Avraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov was a sign for the entire nation. Already the following generation, it split up and it was not the same magnitude anymore for all future descendants. So may HaKadosh Baruch Hu bless us that we'll follow in the ways of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and that we will hopefully raise our children to be close to our families, close to our Torah and our mitzvot, continue in those great ways of our patriarchs and our ancestors. Amen, v'amen.